Well, hello everybody and welcome to the live. Loads of people here. Happy Easter Sunday, wherever you are. Um, of course, I'm Gary Bembridge, the Slips of Travellers, another live stream where for the next 60 minutes we will 60? <laughs> 60 minutes, we will uh, I'll answer as many of your questions as I possibly can. Um, so here I am in London and it's a cloudy old day. Um, so let's get going. Um, just a couple of bits and pieces, housekeeping, just a reminder, although most of you here regular know this, is write the word question if you've got a question, and that makes it so much easier for me to see you amongst the various chitting and chatting, which goes on. And um, next week, there will not be a live stream, because next Saturday, uh, we will be boarding those people coming on my patron and member group cruise. Um, we will be embarking um, Holland America Eurodam on Saturday, um, so I won't be doing a live stream. What I might try and do, and I'll see how the Wi-Fi is, I might try and do a live stream when we do one of our kind of group meetups at some point. So keep an eye out for that, and that's something we may do, because I know other people often have, have done group cruises, have done that as a chance for people to sort of sell it to people back home, um, talk about how the group is going group cruise is going. So we'll see um, if that works and see what the Wi-Fi is like. I've seen kind of mixed reports about the Wi-Fi actually at the moment. Uh, just a reminder, the next group cruise after this one is in September, which is the uh, Canadian and New England. So anyway, let's get stuck into the questions. Um, we won't spend a lot of time on housekeeping. I'm sure I'll come back to a few other bits and pieces. So a couple of posts, um, questions came on just before I started. Uh, and this one actually get asked quite often, um, particularly by first-time cruisers in our chicken salad. Uh, I know it's a first-time cruiser from the uh, point they raised above. If you don't buy the Wi-Fi package on the cruise, can you still use the app on your phone? So yes, you can, because the, what all the cruise lines will do is their app will work uh, without buying a Wi-Fi package. Also, you'll sometimes find certain sites will work. So some of them might give you a new site, a lot of them will let you, of course, go to their own site. Um, so there might be a few individual sites um, that you can use, um, but you can get the whole functionality without buying the Wi-Fi package. Um, uh, Gregory asks you the question, uh, going on a Viking cruise and spending New Year's Day 2026 in uh, Ephesus, Turkey, should I spend the money for their tour or do a third party tour? So I'm guessing probably, uh, Gregory, that Viking isn't offering, offering uh, Ephesus as one of their freebie tours, or one of the included tours. I'm guessing it's probably an extra tour, uh, just uh, based on the way you've asked the question. Um, generally speaking, Viking normally have pretty good providers. So I would definitely look at their tour, uh, look at the detail of their tour and see what you think of their tour, because generally speaking, it's pretty good and their pricing's not that crazy. If you do want to look for a third party, you can start by looking at sites like Venture Shore or uh, Shore Excursions, group.com. They're a good starting place to look. The other place to look is join the roll call for your specific cruise and find out what other people are doing. Because you'll often find what happens is many people through the roll call, um, people have been there before or they've got a really good contact with a, a local uh, guide or something like that. And they sometimes might put together a little van or a, you know, a minibus or something, uh, which other people can join. So that's kind of another option really worth looking at. So uh, let's have a look. So this is a really um, hot topic. Uh, Frank, uh, we booked on an Antarctic cruise in January that includes South Georgia, which of course, anyone who's ever watched any of my uh, Antarctica uh, videos knows that uh, I always say, strongly recommend if you possibly can afford the time and the extra budget to include South Georgia. So Frank's asking if I'm concerned about the avian flu limiting the opportunity to land for your similar cruise in the fall. So yes, I'm going at the end of October uh, on Silver Sea, Silver Endeavour, that's what I've booked on, uh, which I'm very excited about to go back, um, both doing a Silver Sea expedition, uh, the new ship Endeavour, which they bought from when Crystal went bust, uh, and also to go back to South Georgia Island. So Frank, at the moment, following various trips that are there, they are do seem to be doing landings, but you're right. I am worried about whether avian flu uh, accelerates, because uh, obviously we don't want it to accelerate there, uh, just a, a, anyway, as well as from a selfish perspective calling. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm hoping that, that it seems, certainly 
follow us following some seaborne cruises recently that caught on south georgia sort of before the end of the season because now the season's obviously closing because heading into winter i don't know whether avian flu what happens over winter whether that kind of kills it off or not so uh, i'm basically hoping that it's that it's it's not an issue but we won't really know i guess till close to the time with these things based on what the rules are um you know south georgia has quite strict rules and kind of governing governance as it were um Brian asking a question. A couple of people asked questions actually about transatlantics. I think that's one of the questions Barbara had asked, uh, which is quite nice because it comes up on the, the list. So, Brian, um, my wife and I want to cross the North Atlantic on Queen Mary 2, and we plan to do it in May 2025. When is the best time to book, and should we book on board during a Cunard cruise this May? So one of the things I would say, Brian, is uh, interesting. I was actually looking next year at sort of around the June time, what availability and stuff was. And overall, at the moment, availability looks quite good. So one of the things I would do is I would keep an eye sort of on availability. I don't know what cabin grade you're looking at, going at, but I would, I would keep an eye on availability because generally speaking, what happens as ships fill up, they have dynamic pricing and pricing tends to move upwards. So I would just keep an eye a little bit on on availability. If there's lots of you know cabins at every grade, you might feel less worried about prices shifting too much. Secondly, what I would do, Brian, is I would make sure that you signed up for the Cunard marketing emails, because if they do do any specific promotions or discounts, they will send those out on email. And obviously keep in touch if you're a travel agent with those. So if you're going quite soon, because you're going in May, so, so and you're on board a Cunard cruise, I, I would probably wait until then for a couple of reasons. One of which you'll get a bit of extra onboard credit or whatever they're doing on board. It normally tends to be onboard credit, sometimes lower um, deposits. Uh, sometimes you can move your crews without any penalties. So it varies on what they're doing. I'm not 100% sure what they're doing at the moment. So I would probably wait because you're going to get extra stuff. Uh, you know, it's not going to be huge, but it's going to be a little bit different. They will have obviously whatever the best deals are at that time, which your travel agent or whatever can get. Um, but also they will be able to you know, help you choose cabins and that sort of stuff. Also, um, really importantly is if you do have a travel agent, of course, they can then associate that new booking with your travel agent so your travel agent can pick it up and run with it so i would probably wait the one thing i would say if you are planning to book a cruise on board my experience with all cruise lines really but particularly with cunard is the cruise consultants get really busy really quickly particularly as the cruise uh, heads toward the end so quite early on i would probably try and get an appointment or get to see them um, because they do just get really 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 busy so that and you know it's it's, it's quite soon coming up in may um hey here which is great um so let's have a look barbara was asking a question around uh i'm assuming queen mary 2 it was the question barbara was a bit of a typo because obviously queen uh, qe2 is now a hotel in dubai um so i'm assuming it's Q queen mary 2 so um uh, Atlantic, September 2025, your recommendations on two friends sharing in Queen's Grill, Penthouse or Royal Suite. So Barbara, I mean, uh, you know, uh, I mean, I've, only, I've, I've once stayed in the Penthouse on Queen Mary 2, uh, we got upgraded. We normally book like a Q5 or a Q6 um, when we're going on Queen Mary 2. Uh, and that's quite a decent size, you know, it's quite a big sized cabin. So if you've got the budget to go up to a Penthouse or Royal Suite, that's fantastic. So, um, but I think you'll probably find a Q5 or Q6 is also a really good size for two people sharing. Um, you, you know, you have, uh, you know, the bath area, um, you know, the bar, you have obviously one bathroom, you don't have a separate toilet, two toilets, which uh, you have once you get up into the bigger suites. I mean, the penthouse is a much bigger cabin. You have the dining area, you have a seating area, um, but you still basically, well, I guess we'll have twin beds. So it's really around whether you want to kind of just have a much bigger kind of cabin. But certainly I would say Q5, Q6, uh, which I think is just, you know, called Queen's Grill Suites or whatever, um, is would actually be perfectly a uh, perfectly good size uh, for, for two people sharing. If you've got the budget, I mean, the penthouse was fantastic. When we did the penthouse, it was great. The problem with always when you go with those high cabins, it's always really hard to basically come back. So great to see you. Mark's here, which is fantastic. Mark will be joining. Uh, Mark and his wife, uh, Nanita, will be joining uh, as one of the people coming on the group cruise, which would be great to meet Mark in person. Uh, Mark is also, uh, obviously, because people come on that crew, cruise are either a patron or a channel member. Uh, Mark is a patron. So just to, as a reminder, a little segue, a little sell, is I do have a channel membership, which you can join on YouTube. You look at the join button below, um, and you'll see different perks at different levels. 
or on Patreon, across the Patreon, uh, where there's all different scales of benefits and perks. And often one of those big things is early release, ad-free uh, of the videos. You get them at least a week before is one of really popular perk. But also during the normal trips, I post normally video updates, which um, we'll see how it goes. The group is with them too busy to do that, but hopefully I will do those there. So Lewis here, Malpex here, Hike is here as well. Uh, Hike, another uh, big, uh, is going to be a group cruiser, which is fantastic. Um, so let's have a look. Andrew and Diana here calling all ports. I have to apologize. I realized afterwards, just when I wrapped up, that I called uh, uh, Andrew Richard <laughs> last time. But uh, uh, good to see them here. Um, Dean, okay, this is a, this is a really interesting one because this one comes around quite a lot. So some YouTubers have commented that staffing on cruise ships are lacking since the resumption of COVID. Is this the case? So the, Dean, I'm not sure whether, you, you know, there's two things that people talk about, um, uh, both not only YouTubers, but also you'll see that a lot in the reviews, one of which is staffing levels. And the other is just kind of the, I guess, I don't want to say competency, that's wrong. It's just sort of, uh, how you know, how on ball a ser the service level is. Um, so I would say that I have certainly been on some ships which have been uh, clearly understaffed. Now, that was a real problem when ships came in more. So there was more kind of a, a 22 into 23 issue. Most uh, cruise ships that I've been on talking to, like the crew and stuff, it seems that they're kind of, more or less up to speed. But one of the things I do think personally is I do think that overall, you know, after the, the shutdown is uh, a lot of people didn't come back. A lot of experienced people didn't come back to ships. So the, the, there's been a lot of recruiting of people new to ships. Uh, and also there's been quite a lot of added capacity. So if you link, you know, if, if you look at like even Silver Sea, you know, there you have had five or six ships added um, you know, sort of in that run-up just through COVID, some got delayed and stuff like that. Um, you know, obviously you've got Royal Caribbean lots and lots of ships, uh, even a princess with some princess, et cetera, et cetera. So you've got a lot of new ships coming on board. So I feel what's happened is the, a lot of the experienced crew is sort of diluted across the ships. So actually, I do think that probably service is not as sharp as it could be. Also, compounding that challenge is that ships are selling fuller than ever before. They're selling, uh, you know, up to and where beyond uh, pre-pandemic shutdown levels. And, you know, just listening to what cruise lines are reporting, they're all selling on average 102 to 103% capacity on average. So that means many ships are selling above uh, normal capacity. So ships are very full. So you've got that kind of combination, if you if you like, of things. I think one of the things I have felt, and I do talk about it in my Silver Sea uh, video, uh, which is coming, uh, yeah, my Silver Sea one is out, I think, yeah, my Silver Sea one is out uh, last week. Um, I talk about how I felt it has sort of shifted a little bit more into an ask and receive, uh, you know, so, you know, whereas before it was a little bit more proactive. So then, personally, I don't think it's a humongous issue, but I think it is probably not you know, I do think it's probably not quite as quite as good. Um, and I've seen that across the board. Um, not that it's bad, I don't think. I mean, in the early days after shutdown, you know, ships were kind of very understaffed uh, at times, very inexperienced. So I think it's, I think they will find, they, they will sort of find their stride. Larry making the point, of course, it's Ramadan at the moment as well, um, which of course is quite challenging when you're in the Northern Hemisphere because the days are getting longer and longer as well. Uh, dinner made easy with uh, Dina. We love Holland America. Hope you have a great cruise. Thank you very much. I definitely, you know, I'm a big uh, fan of, um, on America, so it's going to be very interesting. Eurodam is one of these sort of old, older ships. In fact, talking about Eurodam, I just was saw on Facebook in one of the Holland America groups that there was a bit of a fire alarm uh, in the uh, fire in the uh, engine room or something like early early hours of this morning, which was kind of put under control and stuff. Um, so that sort of sends lots of uh, lots of uh, lots of um, uh, drama overnight, but was uh, one of those things in the long goes off and it's all very panicky and they get, they get on top of it, which is good news. Um, Treatment actually asked the question, how do I get on one of your group cruises? So uh, good question. So basically um, the thing to do is if you go to my website, tipsfortravelers.com, so it's travelers with two L's, you'll find a little tab there 
um, on the, the menu, which says group cruises or my group cruises or something like that. Um, and on there, there should also be um, the ability to sign up for a mailing list uh, to any future group cruises. So I only have the one that's in a week's time, and the one in September scheduled at this point in time. Um, and on there, it will also tell you how you can join existing group cruises. So the uh, Celebrity Eclipse one theoretically is kind of closed and sold out. Um, th it is still possible, or the selling is very full, uh, to sort of join a wait list or Sarah can check if there's any ability to get onto that uh, sailing. Prices for that have gone up very high because there's no group rates on that anymore. So it's kind of the market uh, going rate. Uh, hotels are now also very expensive, very busy time. So a lot of people have looked at that and back to it. I feel like I'm unselling my group cruise. But that's basically what you do. Um, so I have a mailing list specifically for group cruises. Um, I also have a main mailing list, which I actually put a link uh, in this, which I should do, which I'm going to start um, doing more regular monthly mailings. And I do talk about it on things like here as well. So so that's uh, that, that's basically how how I do it. Um, Mark has been watching Calling All Ports uh, video. So yeah, Calling All Ports, I was on um, the uh, Oceana Vista with, uh, and they've done two videos, certainly two videos that I've noticed so far. First impressions of things you should do on Oceana Vista. So um, uh, take a look at those. My Oceana uh, video, will be out in two weeks time or three weeks time i can't remember which um the video that came out this week is around cruises to avoid and the one next week which the patrons for the moment is one around cruising and trains um which will probably be that one the next one public one uh, naughty town animal <laughs> love that uh hi gary what neighborhood would you recommend staying post cruise in london i'm looking for a convenient safe classy area uh, in between Tower of London area and South Bank area. I'm between Tower of London area and South Bank area. Um, so, so I guess you're, you, you, I, I think you're saying you that's where you want to stay between Tower of London and South Bank. So that's quite a very narrow uh, period, uh, a narrow period. Uh, I mean, the, the challenge with, with that is a lot of that obviously depends on your budget because a lot of the very uh, nice neighborhoods, which are very central, are very expensive. Um, you know, so if you're talking about staying in kind of the Knightsbridge area uh, or um, Covent Garden area, but there are around that sort of area, there are quite a few hotels. I mean, there's hotels right at the Tower of London and stuff. So um, uh, I would, I, as the advantage with the underground system is you can pretty zoot around. If you're in kind of zone one, that central thing, you can you can zoot around uh, fairly easily. So I would I would say. Look, I mean, literally look at some hotels around Tower of London. Tower of London is a little bit like it, it's just very built up and stuff there. Um, so is, is the South Bank area. It's kind of very, that whole around water and stuff is very built up. I would probably look a little bit more, if you can, across at Co Covent Garden, because then you're within walking distance of Leicester Square, Covent Garden, very easy tube connections, to, uh, you know, to get to Tower of London, uh, to go to Buckingham Palace or whatever. So Covent Garden, it's very busy. But it's a great place, and there's a, there's a lot of hotels there. It's near the West End and stuff. That's a really good tourist sort of place to to stay, I would say. Um, Jake is asking the question. Um, hi there, Jake. Because Jake was uh, our game, gamer. You, you were um, talking about gaming last last weekend. Uh, HDMI cable, so if you've got that sorted. Um, so we'll be on Norwegian Spirit Alaska cruise in May. What's the cheapest way to get onto a glacier in Juneau or on the other popular stops? Now, Jake, the bad news is this, this it, 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 cheap is really a relative word. I mean, to get onto a glacier, you're easily talking between $400 and $600 uh, dollars per person. Um, that's what it will cost you uh, going through the cruise line. Uh, but also if you're going sort of more direct through some of the, uh, the helicopter providers. The challenge often is the, a lot of the cruise ships kind of suck up a lot of the capacity that they have. Um, so uh, when you get off the ship uh, in Juneau, one of your options, Jake, is to, there's a lot of booths right along the waterfront. Like there's probably about 10 or 15 booths there all offering various range of tours. That's one way to do is to get off and see what they've got available that day. Um, and that's probably going to be some of the, 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 the better the, the better pricing. I mean, uh, you could probably also kind of literally Google, Google a, a sort of uh, helicopter providers. So that's probably going to be your 
your cheapest option. The other thing I would do, Jake, though, is also take a look. I mentioned it earlier if you were here uh, at ventureassure.com and uh, cruise assure excursions group.com and see what they're offering and what, what their sort of prices are. They will often tend to be a little bit uh, less expensive than the cruise line option, but it's going to cost you a lot of money. Um, you know, a, a lot, a lot of money. Um, so, um, Laurie asking the question, I don't drink, my husband does. What do you think of the drinks package? So, Laurie, the challenge with the drinks package is pretty much every cruise line. I'm trying to think if there's any exceptions. I can't think of any offhand. But if one person in the cabin buys a drinks package, the other p people over the age of 18 or 21, depending on where you're sailing from, because obviously drinking age in the US is 21, so a lot of ships sailing out of the US will stick to the 21 uh, age limit once you're in Europe, it tends to be 18, and most of the lines will adapt to the 18. But they will normally say everyone over the age of 18 has to buy the same drink, has to buy the same drinks package. So uh, for, for you, if you're a non, if you don't drink any alcohol, you, you know, you're probably going to find you're paying an awful lot of money. It's probably going to work out much uh, more cost effective to just buy them ad hoc um because they might require you the same one so you can't buy like a, a soft drink package uh and you buy the alcohol one. now you could talk to the cruise line when you're on board see if there's any flexibility in that but generally speaking they won't uh do that um the other thing you could do laurie is you could do a little calculation where there are a couple of sites there's one on uh, cruiserly.com and one on cruisemummy.co.uk so if you just uh look look for drinks package calculator so google that i have links in some of my videos, but the easy thing to do, just Google drinks package calculator and either the Cruisely one or the Cruise Mummy one normally comes up. And then what you can do is choose your cruise line and then input what you think um, your husband will drink. Uh, that will tell him whether that's actually worth him even buying a drinks package based on your cruise line. But then you sort of have to think, okay, but now I'm going to be paying double. So it's probably unlikely that it's going to work. So also with drinks package, when you look at them, they have various rules. So um, most of them, you know, you know I always, I'm, I don't drink alcohol, but I always think the drink packages include so much booze. Um, and particularly if you've got a very poor intensive, it's hard to see how you can drink that. But normally you're allowed up to 15 alcoholic drinks or drinks from the drinks package. It's normally up to set price, like $15 or $17. Now, some cruise lines, if the drinks are more expensive, you pay the difference. Sometimes you don't. Um, so there's a few bits and pieces there, but I would start with that almost like financial uh, calculation. Um, Bapak asking the question here, um, have you done an Iceland-Greenland cruise? So I haven't done a combination. I've been to Iceland a couple of times, I think three times now, and I've been to Greenland once on an expedition. Um, but I haven't done a combination. Now, as a little aside, um, one of the things that I'm currently doing at the moment is um, I'm doing a, uh, again, I just did it with patrons and channel members at the moment, is like I'm doing like a choose my cruise where I've looked at all the cruise lines that I haven't been on, all the uh, activities that I either haven't done or get asked a lot, like Iceland Green Combination um, and some of the new ships. And they're currently voting on which ones that they really want me to do. And Iceland Greenland is one that's coming up quite high there. Um, so I think the appeal for that is a lot of those, like I did a very expedition cruise, so it was a small ship, RIB boats, you know, little boats, um, and uh, they're very expensive as well. Uh, but people are looking more at a combination, sort of things that kind of America do or celebrity do. So I think I'm probably going to be doing one of those uh, at, at some point. So, um, yeah, so... Uh, yeah, so some people saying I was a little bit late in, so um, my my mic wasn't quite working, so I was probably slightly late, not horribly late. So hopefully that's um, that's worked for you. Uh, Echo Bravo um, uh, is here. Do you find that it as it it's as important to use a travel agent when booking a European river cruise versus an, versus an ocean cruise? So Echo Bravo, I I do because in fact also with um, river cruising is. There are a lot of providers, and it's a quite an, you know, as of on a per day basis, it's quite expensive. And there's lots of smaller known uh, lines. So often they can look at kind of a, at the kind of wide range of lines, spend time with you, understanding what it is that you really want. And, you know, they might 
be able to find you something like Riviera or across Europe, which is much more cost effective or understand do you want to be a little more active if you're going with different age groups or whatever. So I do think it's quite important because it's quite a big outlay. Often also what a lot of people tend to do is um, do pre-stays, post-stays, so they can kind of bundle all that together. So <clears throat> I, I, I personally uh, think uh, it, it, it is. And also, you know, choosing the right river, because there are, most people focus on the Rhine and the Danube, for example, but there are multiple uh, rivers. As an aside, why I think about it, although I don't have this as one of the questions, uh, I mentioned last week, if you were here, um, I get, I'm getting asked a lot of questions on river cruising and a lot of them were very similar. So what I've done is I've taken all those questions from the different um, live streams and the answers I gave, they've been added to. And I've put a, now a, a post on my blog, so tipsoftravels.com, which I think is still the, the first one there, which is the most asked questions that I get. This is not one of them. That's a good one. I should probably add to it. Um, so just a little aside, because I said I was going to do it. Um, oh, here we are. So this is, this is Alan. Just got off the Beyond in the retreat and was somewhat disappointed. Just booked Yacht Club on the Virtuosa. Do you think I will be disappointed? So, Alan, um, it's interesting, you know, the, the, the retreat in, in Celebrity is, is I, you know, more people constantly be talking about uh, their disappointment. I, I think a lot of it often hinges around it is a very expensive, uh, it's very expensive now. And, you know, definitely for the same price as, uh, you know, going to retreat, you can easily uh, go on even a Silver Sea, a Seabourn, uh, even sometimes a region, depending on which you're in, um, people feeling it's just not quite on uh, on the boil, as it were. Is that a good analogy? I don't know. Um, I've always had really good experience with so sorry that you were disappointed. Um, uh, I've just booked your club on the virtues. Do you think I'll be disappointed? It is a very different, it is a pretty different experience, not very different. It is quite different because it is also has one big difference is that it's a completely enclosed ship within a ship. So with your know, retreat, it's dotted around the place. I know you can go up the stairs from the lounge into the into the uh, onto the the deck and everything. But in the club, it's all enclosed. So the restaurant, the, the very big, very busy, active lounge is there. You know, the lounge is, is a real social hub because they do great afternoon tea there. In the evening, they have entertainment. Um, they you know all the drinks are free or not free. Because you've paid for them, obviously, but including the fare. Um, so, and there's snacks all, all around. So, it's a very kind of different uh, experience. Um, but obviously, then you're on a, a much bigger, boisterous ship. Personally, I felt, although you might disagree once you, if you just want to be on, I feel that the food in Lumini is, is, is kind of a, a, a level up, but you are paying higher up. And then the, I also might steer you towards a video I, which came about two weeks ago maybe three weeks ago, which is where I compare the five uh, ship within a ships. Um, and I talk about Yacht Club, I talk about uh, Retreat, uh, what Royal do, uh, the Haven, uh, and what Cunard do, and I compare them all and kind of rank them. And also, Alan, what I've got is I do have a video specifically on the Yacht Club as well, um, which will probably help because it will show a lot of the Yacht Club, and it's on Virtuosa, so it will show. Me personally, I... I was less keen, but it was more because I was less keen on the Virtuosa. You know, it's a very big ship. It's very loud. It's very boisterous. And that it was more that didn't kind of quite connect uh, for, uh, for me as, as, as much. So it was more about the ship experience. But the Yacht Club, uh, I mean, they do the Yacht Club very, very well. They have really, really good afternoon tea, really good afternoon tea. Um, so, so it will be very different. So I'd also be really keen to see what you see. I do talk in that video around where I rank them all. Um, so I'll leave that as a I'll leave that as a as a bit of a, a bit of a, 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 a teaser. So I'm just gonna have a little bit of slug here. Right. <clears throat> so let me have a slug of water and try not to slug you out. Forever get raw. Forever get raw. Um, it appears that South and West Africa is now becoming a cruising world. Yeah, it is really growing very rapidly. I'm seriously now considering one that goes to Mauritius and Madagascar. Is this on your next to cruise list? So absolutely, I mean, South and West Africa is becoming a massive thing. So I have done uh, this year, I did South Africa. Yeah, this year I did South Africa. I've actually just booked a, about two, three weeks ago um, because I really want to do West Africa. I've actually booked a region navigator from Barcelona down to Cape Town to do West Africa. 
I was looking for lots of itineraries. Now I have been, I've been to Mauritius um, uh, about three times actually, uh, but on a land-based holiday and I've never been to Madagascar. So it's not currently on my list because I'm now kind of committed to that other one, but it's absolutely uh, wonderful. So obviously Mauritius and Madagascar are east, uh, are, that's right, north, yes, east, yeah, are, are east. But, um, but you're right, that, you, there's so many more options. So in fact, the cruise that I was on, which was on uh, Silver Sea, Silver Spirit, um, our, we did, it was part of a bit, much bigger trip, which got, had to terminate because it couldn't go through the Red Sea. But it was going, we did Cape Town to Cape Town, then it was going Cape Town and it was heading up to Madagascar. On, uh, they actually went up to the Seychelles. Um, so I would love to do that. Um, people who've been have uh, said some very good things about that. Uh, calling all ports. Diana has a big birthday coming up and wants to take a once in a lifetime cruise. Personally, what itinerary slash ship would you consider particularly special? So I always I always default in this into uh, Antarctica, kind of that sort of very, something that's gonna be just literally kind of that kind of once in a lifetime Oh my goodness! Uh, experience. So, you know that that obviously means <clears throat> for big birthday, maybe you're allocating a big budget. But that is sort of the, what I would do because it's going to be so remarkable and so incredible that um, it will make that <clears throat> birthday kind of memorable forever, if if, if you like. Um, so that's that's kind of what I default into into there. But sort of that's obviously kind of really going to you know, blow your budget. So let's think of something else. Itinerary ship you would consider particularly special. So I'm trying to think of those big events. Now, <clears throat> I said, remember, you're doing a transatlantic on Queen Mary too, if I remember correctly. That's an, another kind of uh, event, something that's, again, very specific. But I think my initial reaction is something like that, like Ant Antarctica kind of experience. Um, let me think if there's anything else that we, because I know you that you're doing Asia. Um, that's the one. If I think of something else, I will, I will, I will come back to that one. If anyone else has other suggestions, that would be interesting to know what other people would consider uh, to that challenge. Like what Diana should do for her her significant birthday, particularly if you've done a significant birthday one. Uh, that would be really, really interesting to to, to know. Um, Let's have a let's have a look and see uh, Queen Mary two uh, United nineteen sixty six hi there not, looks like you're a nice safari there walking safari very nice um, is there any particular travel agent in the UK you would recommend to book a cruise though? I do have a recommendation which is my travel agent Sarah Bolton I don't think he's here here today because uh, I think she's up she was heading up uh, uh, away um, so Sarah, Sarah Bolton of Travel Counselors is the agent that I personally would recommend. Um, she's fantastic. I mean, I've used her for many years. She works all of my travel. Um, a lot of people on the channel have used her um, and um, people seem very happy with her. So that's who I would recommend. Um, and also what I recommend is, um, I tend to recommend, the reason I like working with someone like Sarah um, is Sarah is works for herself. So Travel Counselors is kind of like a network of and each individual is kind of, they self-employed and and um, travel counselors provides kind of the back office and the clout and the financial underwriting and and all that kind of stuff um, and they get the deals and the relationships with with, um, with the you know the different hotels and cruise lines and all that sort of stuff um, but she lives or dies basically based on how uh, how much people like her um, and do they come back so I really like that versus going with a more big group where you know someone's more of an employee and stuff, um, so she has a real vested interest in that. So Sarah Bolton, I do have. I, I might try and maybe I'll try and leave her details in the notes. But if again, if you actually if you go to my um, uh, blog tipsfortravelers.com, if you just look like that, look along there, there's an article about should you use a travel agent, and her details are are in there. Lisa, call live chat, which is fantastic. Good. Okay. Randy, this is uh, yeah, this is a new development. I recently received an invitation from Cunard to bid for a large cabin for us a Q5 to a penthouse. First, I've seen from Cunard. Third, some thoughts on being worth it. So you're absolutely right, Randy. This is a new development which um, the Carnival Group 
uh, within the UK sort of shifted to both uh, Cunard and Pinot Cruises, uh, which sort of have the same sort of ultimate kind of management structure uh, in the UK. Um, they shifted to what was a lot of other lines were doing, Celebrity, Royal Caribbean, Norwegian, which is instead of just upgrading people uh, based on states where they thought well, we can make more money out of this, so to get people to bid. So a couple of things I would say um, is they have, I noticed because we got one for our our Queen and upcoming cruise, which is very interesting because it's completely all the whole all the Queen's Cruise stuff is completely sold out. So um, the cabins that they really have an upgrade to are sold, and it's hard to see how people can move up. You know, if you're got an inside cabin or an ocean view cabin or even a balcony cabin, there's probably more space to move up. But anyway, so the first thing I would say is I, I they seem to have quite high minimums. So the first thing I would do, absolutely, Randy, is have a look at what a penthouse is currently bookable for, because I have been on many cruises, not on uh, Kinnock Cruise, because it's quite new, where people have bid, it, have bid and they realized actually after they bid it and it's been accepted that they could have just booked it, like upgraded themselves for less, um, because it was on sale for less than they bid. So I would first of all have a look at what it's for sale at and what the difference would be, so you don't overbid as a starting point. Um, secondly, I would also say that if you bid, You've got to bear in mind that you have no say in the cabin they move you to. And um, the military bid is accepted. They charge you the difference, and that's the cabin. There's no going back. So if you've chosen a Q5 cabin in a specific location for a specific reason, uh, bear in mind that you may be moved to a cabin that you don't necessarily like. Now, once you talk about moving up to a penthouse, the chance of that being uh, less attractive is very small. Uh, but again, I would just take a quick look at the deck plan, have a look at where the penthouses are, and there's not many of those, depending on which ship you're on. Uh, you, know, you know, there's not, I'm guessing this is probably Queen Mary 2, because uh, uh, um, no, 3 and 4, not necessarily, actually, because 3 and 4 would be penthouse on, on Victoria, etc. So, um, so I would take a look at where they are, um, and if there's any particular worries that you have. Now, again, on QNR, you know, generally speaking, all the penthouses are in pretty good locations. So on like Victoria Elizabeth, they're very nicely mid-center, if I remember correctly, that eight, kind of nine kind of thing. Um, they, they On Cunard, the penthouses are a little bit more in the front of the ship. Um, but we were once a great, I think you might have heard earlier, to a penthouse, uh, and it was great. It was fantastic. So just have a look and make sure. But those are kind of the, the big watch outs. Um, so uh, again, get caught in the trap. I mean, I, I always felt like we got it and they were, I mean, to upgrade what we've got, we've got like a Q, uh, I can't remember what we've got now, a Q5, I think maybe or something like that uh, on Queen Anne and the upgrades, but it was going to be like 4,000 per person. Oh, that was the other big watch out is bear in mind that you're bidding per person. So if you're in a solo, you will pay double. Uh, that and but so if you're bidding a thousand, two thousand, four thousand, whatever you're bidding, bear in mind that's double. That's how the big watch because some people have got caught out by not realizing that it was uh, per person. DJ Afro Cash, you've been on here before. I don't think we've seen you for a while. Maybe I'm wrong on that. If we do, uh, if doing a cruise ending in Shanghai and staying after only four days, do I need a Chinese visa or can we stay only with US passports? DJ Afro Ash, I think I'm almost 100% sure that if you're going on a cruise to Shanghai, you will need a visa anyway. So uh, certainly every, when, I, when I've been on cruises that go to Shanghai, I'm pretty sure, unless things change, that we've had to get a visa anyway. So you will need a visa. Double check that, but I'm pretty sure you're going to need one for your cruise anyway. Uh, so so uh, certainly we used, we did in the past, I remember when we've been to Shanghai, a couple of cruises getting visas for those. Now, I know that, that could have changed since I've last been there. I've got a Shanghai cruise coming up in next year, so I'm not sure on that. So I would, um, you know, because I haven't been through that process recently, but certainly we had to get them when we did our big kind of world cruise thing once, or legs of world cruise uh, the one time, and then we went a second time on Queen Mary 2, and we had to get visas before. So double check that. One of the best places to look is actually, if you go to the US, I don't know where you're based, let's have a look if I can guess. If you're, yeah, US passports, oh. <laughs> uh, if you go to the US State Department, they have a very good website, which I use a lot uh, com in combination with the Foreign Office one. Um, but if you basically search the country, it will tell you entry requirements and it will tell you around the, around the visa, around the visa thing. 
Arlene joining us on Facebook. So I live stream this on Instagram and on Facebook. I the, the service I use gives me the option to do it on Instagram, but it doesn't really seem to work terribly well. And then you have to do it and you have to go in and do live. And I thought it's too complicated to do that. But anyway, so thank you for joining us on Facebook. Um, so in terms of annual travel insurance, do they cover cruises? Very important if you do book annual travel is make sure that it has cruise cover. So it should cover many of the things, but it's important to do it. So for example, I have annual travel insurance, um, but I've specifically requested cruise cover. So that's quite an important one to do because that then means that you're covered if you ever get, uh, you know, unfortunately you have to get medevac or something like that from the ship. So um, make sure that you've got cruise cover in your annual policy would be my, my definite tip there. Elizabeth, I'm cruising the Eastern Mediterranean on the Seaborn Encore in August. What is your favorite food with Seaborn? Good caviar, <laughs> uh, which is one of the things that Seaborn had pride themselves on is that uh, caviar and loads of caviar. They do things like a caviar and Bellini sail away. So that is my favorite kind of thing because it's just so unusual and kind of a little bit exotic. So that probably is not really what you're uh, wanting to know. I don't have, and I can't think of any other thing that really sort of, sort of, um, you know, kind of that I can. I mean, I remember the food is very good on Seaborn, and but I can't remember there being any specific dish. The, the caviar is the one that really kind of ticks on my mind. So, um, so if you have, um, if anyone else has has a hot tip on uh, on Seaborn, then uh, then definitely do that. Um, Bill is asking a question actually um, for about interline phase agency users become a bit unreliable. And if you understand it, anyone have one that like? So for those of you who don't know what an interline fare is, so um, I covered in one of my videos around people who get cruises, uh, pay much less for cruises or get cruises for free, is interline fares are fares that the cruise line uh, offers to um, people. It started originally, I believe, where it was uh, sort of between airlines where they would offer rates uh, between the airlines, cruises got involved. So it used to be uh, for um, airline employees, ex-airline employees, a lot of the, uh, the, the has expanded out where you can often work in tourist boards or anything travel related and you can get interline fares which are deeply discounted fares uh, which aren't advertised to the general public, aren't available to the general public. And it's quite powerful if the cruise lines want to have some inventory that they want to clear or they want, to, you know, they've got capacity there uh, and they don't want to, deep discounted to the public, they will offer it to people in the travel industry. So if anyone has uh, has a good uh, one for that. So I know a couple of people are heading off on the Eclipse. I think, Bill, you're heading off on an Eclipse uh, cruise. Uh, a couple of other people are. So I know there's a couple of cruises heading out of the US the week that we're on the group cruise, which is why a lot of people aren't, uh, can't come or aren't coming on the group cruise, is because you've got the solar Eclipse. So hopefully you're already that. And I was reading in the paper yesterday, I think it was, they were talking about how um, in Niagara Falls, uh, uh, they have sort of declared not quite a state of emergency, but equivalent because they're expecting like a million people or something to converge on the whole Niagara Falls area. And I guess declaring a state of emergency unlocked all sorts of uh, resources and funding to kind of just cope with those, those numbers. Um, so there we go. Uh, so those of you who see that, uh, there we go. King Goes Cruising is here, which is great. Uh, did anyone watch my Patreon video release on train travel? So there. So that was I was mentioning around how we do the early release. So I've got a video um, which is currently out on that early release ad free, which is looking at uh, the interrelationship between trains and cruises. I talk about how cruise lines, uh, much, much people surprise, own quite a lot of trains uh, around the place and then all the different train trips to do before and afterwards and as excursions and stuff. So I wasn't sure how people would like that, but people do uh, do seem to enjoy it so far. So hopefully when that goes public, uh, it, it will do well. So that'd be great. Um, Jolie. Um, I think you, cruise, uh, you often cruise solo. Any tips to do so more affordably? So Jolie, yes, I do cruise uh, quite a lot um, solo. So I probably do around about 10 cruises a year and I probably do eight of those uh, solo. Um, uh, so my partner Mark probably comes on two of those a year. So this year um, on the Queen Anne and when we do a Christmas one at the end of the year um, through the Panama Canal. Um, so in terms of tips to do some uh, more affordably, 
it is very challenging. Um, I, I do have a video, Jolie, so I will touch, I will give you some things I remember. But if you go to the channel uh, on YouTube, uh, and there's a little search button. If you just type solo or single in there, um, it will bring up a video. And I think the video is called something like how to cruise cheaper solo or something like that. Um, and I dive into much more detail. But the things that I really focus on is I, um, I, I do sign up for all the cruise lines that I'm interested in. I sign up for their marketing newsletters because that's where they're often not solo deals. Um, I, uh, so if there's ever solo deals, so for example, I'm going in July on Seabourn Pursuit to do the Kimberley, which is obviously Seabourn's very expensive. The Kimberley is very expensive, but they, through that email newsletter, I always wanted, and I've always wanted to do the Kimberley, but they sent an email newsletter advertising they were doing, I think it was a 15% solar surcharge on Kimberley sailings. So that meant I could go and do that with only paying 15%. Now, of course, the problem with things like Seaborn, Silver Sea, Paul Gauguin, all those very ultra luxury lines, they're extremely expensive anyway, but they all offer solo deals. So the other thing I do is I do take a look at, at on the cruise line sites where they have solo kind of little tab. Some of them do, but it tends to be the higher end uh, of those. So the newsletter is probably more important. The, the third thing I do is when I'm choosing cruises, I try to do um, shoulder season, which is often when the solo deals are. So you know, anything that's peak, I will never go. So whether it's uh, the Mediterranean or Alaska or, you know, the Caribbean, you know, stay away from peak time because you're more likely to get kind of even with the supplement a uh, lower price. Then what I also do is I keep an eye on, there's a couple of solo travel agents. So in that video, I do talk about a couple of sites, both in the UK and the US, not sure we are, which uh, offer solo deals and stuff. I also keep, I sign up for the Vacations to Go newsletter. Uh, they do. They 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 will run a newsletter maybe every couple of weeks, where they will talk about current solo deals. Uh, they will also they host solo cruises, for example, um, which normally have low solo supplements. Sometimes it's sharing cabins, so that's, that appeals less. So those are kind of the things that 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 I do. But you're right, it is a huge challenge. And obviously, of course, the other thing is look at solo cabins. I do have a list of those, which I need to update on my website. Although my big tip is. When you're looking at a solo cabin, because there's such high demand, you can often get a inside cabin or sometimes even a balcony or an ocean view cabin for less than a solo cabin because because of the dynamic pricing. Solo cabins sometimes end up being more expensive than booking a different cabin and paying a supplement. But have a look at those. So Julia Green with Covent Garden, which is great. Uh, hey, you think you could watch a Negro on my next cruise? I don't understand what that means. Tree grow or Negro? I don't don't understand that question so i will skip over that one <laughs> um mike d uh what do you recommend to get from london to southampton for a group of five so you from london to southampton for a group of five so mike a couple of things i tend to go down to southampton on the train um so you know you didn't have to get a taxi from the train station to whichever of the four or five terminals that they have there, um, but it's not a particularly expensive taxi ride. And they norm often do have <clears throat> sort of slightly bigger sort of like minivans that would probably take a group of five. But even if you had to go into taxis, it's not a very expensive taxi ride. So the, I would look at the train, uh, you know, as one way. It's, it's some often be quicker. Um, so you you get the train from London Waterloo uh, down, which is a direct train down. I would definitely look at that. I mean, the other thing you could do, of course, is then look at, um, you know, uh, booking a kind of a, a minivan kind of thing. A lot of it depends on your luggage. The most expensive option of all is kind of Black Lane, which is uh, what, uh, you know, they are very expensive. Uh, Addison Lee, you could look at to get a quote from, is another kind of company. The problem is they also to be a little bit expensive because they don't get a return fare. Addison Lee tends to be a little bit more local. There is another option, which, uh, which is um, uh, holiday, uh, taxis is another company. They get people to then bid, kind of bid on uh, uh, groups um, of those. So those would be my my kind of top ones, um, I think. Just a reminder to write uh, to write the word question so I don't miss it. So I nearly didn't miss this one. <laughs> Perfectly imperfect. Looking for a smaller upscale cruise for adults. Uh, take a look at um, Oceania, uh, the Oceania. Uh, Azamara, uh, Windstar is kind of that's one, and, and Viking, which is adults only, would be kind of the, you know, so 
to Viking is um, you have to be 18 and over, but that's sort of the sort of the small ship luxury side. And then of course you've got the your premium use of ultra luxury, which is Seaborne, Silver Sea, Regent, Crystal. So those are the ones that I would focus on. I'm assuming you're asking me uh, cruise line there. Um, uh, Michelle saying that if you purchase a premium, they can do a soft drink package. So as I said, really important, come back to the question about the drink package, check with the cruise line. So Regent, uh, uh, Michelle saying that it sounds like Reg on Royal, you can you can, you can can do that. So that's, uh, that's really good to, that's good to know. Uh, Dean. You're going on region Japan in 2025. I'm not a fan of dressing up for dinner in alternatives. So you're extremely limited. But what I would say, Dean, is that uh, region is not as dressy uh, as I expected it to be in reality, and certainly on Japan. So I would go to dinner. I don't think I ever, the whole time I was in region, I never wore a jacket. I'm trying to remember, I took a jacket with me. I must have. I never wore a jacket once on Regent. Uh, so I wore kind of a long sleeve shirt and slacks, I guess you'd call them. That's as dressy as, as I got. Um, and that was pretty standard. I mean, some people, you know, some of the more dressy nights would get very glammed up. But even on those dressy nights, that's, that's what I was doing. So <clears throat> I wouldn't worry about the dressing up. It doesn't have a very strict dress code other than that, no jeans, no shorts caps and stuff for dinner so if you could sit a slack a long sleeve shirt a long sleeve shirt and slacks is very dressy up uh, they don't have an informal dining venue that's one of the things that i found like with the region silver sea seaborne i always found a little bit frustrating so um you do have um some options you you know if you go to uh, seti mari which is the more italian which is what the um, you know the, the buffet becomes in the evening. That's a little bit more informal. Now, on Japan, they didn't the grill kind of area uh, wasn't open in the evenings, um, so that wasn't really an option. But I believe in some warmers. I mean, it's never been open for me on any ship I've been on uh, uh, before. But I know in some settings they do that sort of more informal things to be open. But your option is is basically room service in reality, and that is a pity. I do find that kind of a little bit frustrating because. Uh, what I liked um, when I was on Oceania, for example, which I know is not the same category, but there was a, so many options and you could do an informal because they had the buffet was kind of open, although it was very nicely table laid and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> Kathleen asking, what is the one place you've not cruised to but is at the top of your list? Um, so some of the places I've been to but I haven't cruised. To. So I I have on my list, um, I really want to do more of South America, particularly the Amazon. Uh, I want to cruise uh, more around Australia. I mean, Kimberley, which I'm doing, but um, uh, but I want to do more Australia New Zealand. I have cruised from New Zealand to Australia, but a very long time ago, and I want to do a proper, more in-depth um, Australia um, uh, cruise. I want to do the Great Lakes. Um, uh, especially, and I want to do. I need to actually look because I've actually got the list. I've actually got a list of, of them. Uh, let's have a look. I would actually do, although people think I'm mad, I want to do the Mississippi. I want to cruise Hawaii more properly. Um, and uh, those, those, are the, those are the key ones. Um, Promises often ends up getting into the nuances. So I've done parts of South America, but I haven't done the very top part of South America, and I haven't done Kind of the Amazon part of South America, so I'm always trying to fill in, fill in, fill in those kind of uh, the, those gaps. So there you go for making Easter brunch, uh, lurking and listening, which is uh, which is great. Um, but that's a good point, actually. Warren making the point actually that there are quite a few transatlantic. So I was on New Staten Dam the one time, and uh, towards the end of the season, and when they repositioned, they were heading. So we were up sort of Copenhagen, etc. Way, and then they were heading across. They were doing some Iceland into Greenland into uh, a little bit of Canada and then into New York. So you can sometimes find a little bit of repositioning as well. That's a good point uh, as well. Um, let's have a look. Uh, I feel like I might be missing some people who haven't written questions. Let's have a look. Blah, blah, blah. Tony, you write question. You don't write a question. So Tony, doing England, Scotland, Ireland in July, any suggestions on what not to miss on that cruise? Are the waters rough around the hours? So, um, the, the water ten the, once if you were doing right over the top of, of uh, the UK, um, then it can be a little, little bit bumpy. Normally, between that sort of sort of area, you know, the Irish sort of sea between the UK and there is normally not too is not not too bad at all. 
um, it's more kind of once you get North Sea and up the top that it gets more bumpy. Uh, what not to miss? Um, what not to miss is, I'm not sure. What not? To, a lot of it depends on what you like. I mean, depending on where you, if you're going to, uh, if I don't know whether you're going to both Ireland and Northern Ireland. I mean, in Dublin, a lot of people like to go to the Guinness kind of the factory kind of stuff. Um, uh, with Dublin, if you go to Northern Ireland, there's an amazing Titanic uh, museum is there, which is pretty fantastic. If you go to Scotland, I'm guessing that side, you're probably um, going more into Glasgow side, I guess. Uh, I can't remember, I'm trying to remember what the excursions they do on that side. I've always done Scotland more the other side, the Leith side. Uh, a lot of it, Tony, to be honest, depends on a lot of the kind of the ports that you're heading to. But I would basically try and see stately homes, anything that's kind of historical is really kind of a short, is kind of the shorthand of what, what I would what I would kind of recommend. So uh, let's have a look. Uh, Maggie, the substitute teacher popped up a super chat very kind i appreciate all of your content thank you very much for watching my content thank you for the super chat i need to i always call them super chat and i don't really know what they are so alan of course is giving a suggestion i was toying with the whole point but uh, i'm gonna i'm gonna bring it up so alan suggested that seaborne space dish is thomas keller clam chowder now i was going to mention some of the thomas keller things but then i can't you know thomas keller the actual Thomas Keller restaurant <clears throat> is closing on Seaborn and being replaced with a Mediterranean themed one called Solus, 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 which is a Seaborn concept. But Thomas Keller is still doing some of the main menu and other menu stuff. So I don't know whether clam chowder is on the main menu or not. I can't really remember. But there you are. That's um that's that's an answer. But the, the Thomas Keller restaurant restaurant is uh is, is going and they're phasing that out and lots of people are very upset about that. Um, let's have a look, there's some talk about tipping butlers. I'm guessing I must have missed a question there. Um, so Jeffrey is, I, I think it's, it's partly gone out. So Royal Caribbean overbooked us on Norwegian fjords. They never communicated this to us or our travel agent. They gave us a guarantee cabin, we'd booked A. So I'm guessing, I'll, I'll try and see if that pops up. Here we are of an aft cabin at $50 per person on board credit and a smaller balcony cabin. I mean, it's very interesting. There's been quite a few stories recently around, you know, uh, overselling, which, as you mentioned, because cruise lines are selling so full that they are selling for the, There's some very high profile ones where in fact, Royal Caribbean in Australia, they hadn't told people and people arrived ready to board and it was up to like 50 Roughly, if I'm correct, there was a big article which um, a lot of people were reporting where a Carnival travel agent um, hadn't passed on the message that Carnival had oversold, and a whole bunch of her clients pitched up to discover in Miami that they weren't on the cruise. But to make matters worse, she was on the cruise and went on the cruise, um, and that's she's been lots of flack for that. Um, so I think you know, so there have been a lot of issues. And I guess what cruise lines have been assuming is historically they they overbook because they know they get a, a dropout. But the dropout rates clearly much lower than before. I definitely would push back much harder on the, the compensation side, um, definitely because they should sort of. I would have thought also given you the option to cancel. But I'm guessing you might have got as far as going. No, Royal Caribbean won't be selling the fjords yet. But I would push back on that, um, and you might find they're more responsive. But I think you're right. You've got to be really cautious on that. And, and one things that I've started to do more. Is obviously I've got Sarah travel agent Sarah who keeps on top of that. But also every now and again I do log into all my different bookings and see what's going on. And also I do try uh, my other tip for people, and I do talk about it in one of my videos, is I do try to uh, the minute online check in opens, I check in because come back to your point about ca uh, cabin allocation, it might it triggers that process. But also I know that I've now checked in and I've got my kind of documents it kind of i'm in the system as it were uh sunspot very kindly left a big super chat there looking forward to the new, new england canada to Travis group cruise thank you very much thomas so I'll talk, maybe i'll talk very briefly about that group cruise because uh that's quite a big group cruise there's about 80 people on that and what's very exciting is um uh visit boston uh, uh who i'm uh, working with 
through a contact that one of the other patrons put me on to them because uh, she's involved with them. There's going to be a, a tour after a tour in the afternoon before the cruise of Boston, and then they're hosting a reception um, for everybody, you know, drinks and stuff as well. So um, that's going to be very exciting. So it's, it's very exciting. Also, the visit of Boston have got as excited uh, as well. So we're churning out of time. Let me let me try and do because I've got I've been jumping around a little bit. Yeah, let me let me try and do at least um, at least at least one more at least one more question. So let's have a look. Uh, someone's asking about Royal Opera House, and I have never dined. I've never been to the Royal Opera House other than on a tour when I was like about twenty or something, about 150, 150 years ago. Ah, Natalie, great suggestion. I'll come back to Diana and Andrew. The French Polynesian Islands. What a brilliant idea. That is, the, I don't know, I didn't think of that before because Mark and I, for our 20th anniversary of uh, being together um, last year, we went, we, that's exactly what we did. We did French Polynesian Islands. Uh, so I don't know why I didn't think of that. Don't, um, <laughs> that's really, really, uh, that's really crazy. I didn't think of that because since we especially did that. Amy, does Sarah Bolton work with US cruises? Uh, no, she, generally speaking, she can't because the way the cruise lines work is you sort of have to work with a local person. I do have some recommendations in the US though which is a guy called Gary Pluck, who many people on the channel have used, but also um, another guy called uh, Walter um, of, uh, oh my God, I've got Walter's <laughs> Walter's name, how embarrassing. Um, so, so Walter, um, who I started using recently um, with Where's Walter Travel, that's right, Where's Walter Travel, uh, is another person that I recommend. Again, if, if you go to my blog, tipsatravels.com, uh, just, and you'll sign an art, find an article on there about travel agents. I've got all their details in there. And they, again, all come very highly recommended uh, as well. So we've churned through time. We've run out of time. I know there's many questions there, so I will try and have a look at those and see if there's ways that I can answer those. Uh, as I mentioned, next week, um, <clears throat> I won't be doing a live stream on the weekend because the group cruises heading off and so on. Um, but I will try, if the Wi-Fi is trying to do a, a kind of some sort of live with the group in one of our group meetups. So just keep an eye out for that. And if we possibly can, I will I will, I will, will uh, try and do that. So thanks very much. Um, I will try and do the live stream in like a two weeks time, uh, separate to that other one. So have a great, great rest of uh, Easter weekend. And I thank you so much, so many of you are giving up some of your Easter weekend to join me. Uh, take care.